it doesn't somehow factor into the either micro or macroeconomic guidance and policy parameters that we provide for agriculture. Now, people blame farmers. Just like in every other sector, I increasingly believe that farmers are victims just as consumers are victims of policy signals on which we could spend hours now debating why they arise. This is political economy and many other things, but the fact of the matter is unless farmers have an incentive to not have to exploit the very natural capital on which they depend but become resource managers in their own right and for the sake of society and that economic equation is redefined, forget about all these minor measures that we have talked about here. Climate change. First of all, I think agriculture and the future of agriculture needs to define itself beyond Copenhagen and an agreement there. Because the future of agriculture is happening in the context of climate change, whether there is an agreement in Copenhagen or not. And I would urge you not to let the global platform define itself, and I'm sure you haven't, but I only joined at the end of this discussion, so that's perhaps a bit of a narrow tunnel impression by the negotiations. I think agriculture has to provide a vision of development that ultimately can also influence the way an instrument like the Climate Change Convention can be helpful to it or not. I start from that big picture point of view because this morning I had one of my more happy moments since I assumed my post as executive director. I addressed the Council of Ministers of the OECD in Paris at which, lo and behold, one of the three agenda items was the green economy and the future of the OECD vis-a-vis -vis the green economy. And remarkably, there were over 35 countries with the associated partners, finance and economy ministers, passing a resolution to move forward in terms of a green economy and tasking the OECD secretariat to make this a part of its future work program. It is in part because through climate change we have begun to understand that the phenomena of environmental change, of environmental impacts, is fundamentally affecting the future choices we have in the economic policy domain. And the same is true for agriculture. Now this is, for those of you who follow this for years, nothing new, but I wanted to put it in the bigger context because it is still very often treated as a secondary part of the agenda, when indeed the notion of sustainability and how it relates to the policy incentives, the financial investments into the sector, it should actually be the first departure point. Climate change adds challenges to the future of agriculture. It also does potentially provide opportunities. You have just discussed a number of them and what you have focused on in terms of an agenda for Copenhagen, I would not in any way disagree with you. I think we have the beginnings of an understanding, but quite frankly, agriculture, just like adaptation, because it is not part of the prevalent economic interest model, is suffering in terms of lack of attention. A reference was made to the African negotiators minister, uh, me meeting in Nairobi and uh, the policy process on the African continent. I was extremely pleased with the clarity with which Africa's negotiators and ministers of environment articulated a position for Africa to take to Copenhagen, at which we finally have an entire continent working to bring adaptation to an equivalent level in the discussions to mitigation. And that perhaps may be agriculture's greatest hope in the long term. On the mitigation front, there are very low-hanging fruit. And it is part of another publication I would like to bring to your attention that we call The Natural Fix, came out just 10 days ago, which took on this rather strange phenomenon that under the mitigation agenda, countries are willing to spend billions of dollars on a carbon capture technology curve as, in a sense, the key to dealing with continued fossil fuel electricity generation. Yet, if you take hard-nosed economics, which is what economy and finance ministers always bring to these kinds of agendas, you have to ask yourself, why is it that the best carbon capture and sequestration technology, tested over hundreds of millions of years, is not featuring as a central pillar in the climate change negotiations. It is in the biomass of this planet, in forests, in peatlands, in our soils, that some of the greatest, most efficient, fastest, and effective carbon capture and storage capacity is found on this planet. So if you're looking for, yes, as you said, 
when the making agriculture part of the solution, then let us look here and let us look how the farmer of the future is not just somebody who plants something in the soil or who grows a tree or has a cow or a goat or a hundred or a thousand, but who actually becomes part of a rural economy that is able to not only work on expanding the planet's capacity for carbon capture and sequestration, but also becomes part of a broader rural economy. And that is my final thought on which I end because I know the bar is calling. That when you live in a country like Kenya, where I have my and UNEP's headquarters, and you look at the phenomenon that 50 years after all national development programs, international funding programs, World Bank, GTZ, UNEP, UNDP, you can name them all, 80% of the population still has no access to electricity. How do you explain that in a country that actually has proven geothermal capacity somewhere between two to 4,000 megawatts, in which a geothermal plant was actually built 25 years ago and is producing power at a great rate per kilowatt hour? Instead, the country is right now being forced to bring diesel generators in because the lights are going out, for which it has to pay 10 shillings a kilowatt hour when it can generate its own electricity at four shillings a kilowatt hour. One law changed the dynamics of renewable energy in Kenya. It's called the feed-in tariff, introduced in January of this year, as a result of which within six months, the largest wind power farm on the whole African continent is on the verge of being signed off through a private consortium with the African Development Bank as the financial arranger. It's in Turkana, one of the poorest parts of Kenya. 350 turbines, 300 megawatts. In brackets, Kenya's current total installed capacity is 1,100 megawatts. So one third of new power. I give you this example because one of the most frustrating experiences from an African perspective, and I have spent many years of my life working on the African continent, is in part also reflected in the debates we have about what is possible in our economy today and what is not possible. Wind hasn't just started blowing in Kenya since January. Geothermal power, even proven with a power station 25 years ago. Ask yourself, why do these decisions sometimes not get taken? It's the same issue that goes to the heart of what kind of future for agriculture are we looking for. And I end with a simple challenge to us in UNEP as much as to our colleagues in FAO and IFAD and many of the other institutions that work on the future of agriculture. A green revolution of the future has to be a green revolution with a capital G, which defines its long-term strategy in terms of sustainability and which from that point of departure looks at the climate change issue both as a reality it now has to factor into its own future as much as it looks at the pots of money through the climate change equation as something that can resource its own strategy. But that strategy cannot be defined by a narrow climate change agreement. It has to be defined as a vision for the future of agriculture. And for those who still doubt that different forms of agriculture are possible, just note that organic agriculture is still considered to be one of those um, leather sandal, muesli eating luxuries is today a multi-billion dollar business and with a research partner called UNCTAD who cannot be accused of being an environmentally rosy spectacled entity, we undertook a study of 120 projects working with organic farming on the African continent. And lo and behold, what we found is productivity increases of anywhere between 80 to 128 percent. Greater soil fertility, better water retention, better carbon storage because plants actually do like carbon. Thank you very much. Thank you, Thank you very much, Akin Steiner.